of all, I want everybody to know this is being recorded. So um, it'll be uh, uploaded to our YouTube channel sometime in the, the coming week now that I'm here, I'll able, be able to do it. So thank you everybody for coming today and welcome to our Filipino American National Historical Society and Museum. Um, uh, just a, a couple of introductions. We have a couple of people from our board. We have Richard, Dr. Richard Tanaza, our board president. We have Robert Ragsack, our, one of our board members. Uh, I'm board member Terry Doris. Um, we have Deborah Louie here from Delta College, the Apiasa group. And uh, Elena Mangajas is one of our, our steady volunteers, as well as uh, Beverly and Cabo, who's responsible for a lot of these exhibits up on the wall. So uh, we'd like to uh, so we welcome you to our in-person presentation. Those are kind of few and far between now during COVID times, but uh, we thank you for coming out. And there may be a couple more people who come in during the, the talk, but we'll you know, see them. So I'm going to introduce Jeannie, and she will tell you about herself and about her new book. Thank you. You do. I'm going to sit down for the first part of it and then stand for the, the reading part of it. And, um, and I do apologize if I do cough every now and then. It's just allergies. I, we've been tested, you know. <laughs> but, uh, um, I really was looking forward to, to being here and having the very first book signing of Turn Right at the Water Buffalo here mm -hmm. yeah. because of, frankly, my Uncle Frank Perez and Aunt Liddy Perez, who welcomed me to this community when I was this young hippie thing, <laughs> coming into California wondering, where am I going to meet people that are my tribe, you know, people <laughs> that I can, I, I can identify with. I know they're here. I heard they're here. <laughs> And uh, so that was my, my, my journey through, throughout California to find out, you know, where, where I belonged, you know, where I came from. Um, my parents, uh, James Baroga, was, uh, I was telling Chris, uh, the Bing Baroga and the Aloha Serenaders Band in Milwaukee. Uh, they traveled the Route 66, ended up in Milwaukee where all of us were born, uh, but he had a uh, a radio station segment on KRPR in LA, so he was known there, got to know a lot of musicians, uh, and uh, along the route of Route 66 as well. He met my mom in Ormoc City at the, uh, at the end of the war, essentially, when they were still occupying Ormoc, and um, decided then and there, you know, he took one look at it and said, there she is, there's my girl, you know. <laughs> Um, and uh, so with the Brides Act, she was able to come here to the, the United States. Um, he was still in his third of his fourth tour of the Army. So he was still stationed in uh, the Seattle area. So he was up there for a while while she stayed pregnant with my uncle, who <coughs> essentially took care of her until he was ready to leave. And then they traveled down to L.A., stayed there for a while. And um, that's when they decided, you know, I think I'll go to the Midwest because there's a fellow musician there. And uh, he said we could stay in their house with his family. He goes there. He says, I'll send for you. Sends for my mother, who was um, pregnant with me at that point and was almost born on the trip. So that was interesting. Um, and then that was it. We, we settled in, in Milwaukee. Uh, we were one of, at that time, maybe, maybe 20, 25 Filipino families. So in our neighborhood, we, there weren't very many of us. You know, we, we met every year <coughs> for the, excuse me, <coughs> the Filipino picnic. Um, and that's when we got to see all the other Filipinos in Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I was really surprised that there were so many of us then. Because <laughs> when you're in a neighborhood, when you're the only family, you know, it's, it, it's a little lonely, you know? And I think now, they the last I heard is that they took over a whole hotel in downtown Milwaukee to have their, their, their gatherings. So it's a huge 
huge community there of Filipinos in, in, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin right now. Um, right around the uh, uh, a turbulent 60s, 70s, 72, I came to California because I figured I wanted to be an artist. Mm -hmm. And um, at that point, I thought I was going to be a graphic artist. Um, that didn't go too well. <laughs> I, I had my own business as a graphic artist, but I just, after a while, it was like, been there, done that, I need to do something I, I really love. And it was always writing. I just didn't know how much I loved it back then. Um, so when I decided, you know, I think I'm going to pursue this a little bit more, um, got very interested in theater in the South Bay, particularly around Palo Alto, Stanford, Theater Works, if anyone's heard about that. Um, they were the musical, they are the musical theater company down in that area, and I became their literary manager. So I got to read lots and lots and lots of scripts and learned what not to write, <laughs> as well as what, what worked as, as writing for plays, for theater. And uh, so I cut my teeth on that, you know. Um, I'm, I'm kind of skipping <laughs> around because um, I do want to get to the reading, but this is how it came about. Mm -hmm. I decided after so many years of writing plays, let's just see if I can do what I always really wanted to do, which was to write a book. And could I do that in my lifetime? <laughs> could I do it at all? And I realized, well, all, all I can do is just try it. And a story that had been lingering for a long time, which I had uh, opposed to, at that point, you know, uh, a friend, <laughs> Tony <laughs> Williams, um, and another friend who turns out to be a producer in New York. He's now the producer of um, For Colored Girls, which just opened on Broadway. Mm -hmm. So those are the two people I, I pitched to at first, and they both said, you should write a book. Mm -hmm. I went, oh, no, I can't write a book, you know, that'd be, you know, that would take so much time away from my playwriting and all that kind of garbage, you know, because mm -hmm. <laughs> I realized I did want to write that story. So I would say, I would say that it was really, I, I posed it in 2020, something like that, maybe 1998, and it took all this time to finally get to the point where it is now a published book, and I would have to say that I would have had to go through what I was going through in order to have the insight to write about it a lot more succinctly. I think when I was at that age, I was still too far away myself from the culture, you know, that I, I couldn't quite identify it in order to write about it. And uh, so I've been to the Philippines since then. I. I've written a lot of plays that uh, involve Filipinos because that's who I want to see on stage. I want to see the people I, you know, I, I live with and I and, and I have uh, have uh, um, you know connections with. I wanted to change the American stage, and uh, the plays that I wrote, I have to say, I have done that um, to the point where. Now my collection of plays are at Stanford University, and I'm the only Filipino-American playwright that is housed there. So wow. that was... Uh, thank, you. thank you. So, um, so with that, um, why don't I just give you like a little overview of the book, because obviously I'm not gonna read the whole thing to you, you know? <laughs> um, but just to give you, a lay, <coughs> a lay of the land. The characters in this book are <coughs> a family that has been separated. Um, the mother was born and raised in Ormoc City, Leyte. And she's one of the few that decides that she's going to leave uh, through marriage, marrying my father. Uh, to uh, see what she could do in, in the States. She wanted to see how she could make it in the States. And that was at a cost, you know. I think we all kind of identify with that somehow, you know. Um, her daughter, the uh, uh, main character, Lainey, 
one of five of her children, uh, is invited to come along. Already a point, oh, thank you, thank you. It's okay. Thank you. Already uh, making her somewhat suspicious, like, why are you asking me? You know, the other ones are so much more uh, advanced in their careers and they've got something mm -hmm. going on. They have families, they have houses, you know, they don't have as many bills as I have. Why are you asking me? But it was like, oh, it's a free trip. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna go on this trip, you know. So that's Lady and Rena, mother and daughter. And uh, so until she gets over there, she doesn't really know her mother set up a few things for her that she just forgot to tell her. Like, oh, you have a bodyguard. You have to have a bodyguard. And that just didn't, you know, uh, uh, click with her because she was so used to traveling by herself and being on her own and I can do it. I'm a modern, liberated female and I can go wherever I want. I don't need a bodyguard. Okay, so <laughs> that's part of the story. They visit Rena, Rena's cousin, Nita, in Ormac City. Um, she's married to Horatio. Their daughter, Bonita, is married to Nate. So it's, again, Nita, Horatio, have Bonnie, who's married to Nate, their two children, Terry Terry and Sari Sari. <laughs> <laughs> and there's uh, various uh, 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 neighbors. Um, one is uh, the neighbor who plays his music constantly, all through the night, 24-7, which something was something that uh, uh, Lainey doesn't quite understand, but she learns to, you know. So this sort of sets up the whole scenario, coming to a place where she hasn't been given quite all the, all the information she needs to be in a country she's never been in before, you know, in a culture she never really had been introduced to um, as, as deeply as she should have been, and um, it changes her life, which means it changed my life. It changed my life immensely as a writer, as a person, you know, as an artist. Um, and that's why I realized this is the story I needed to get out now. Because it does apply now to a lot of people who are still going through their same type of journey, in a way. Um, I think we all still journey. Uh, there's, um, there's, there's a situation that happens that has to do with uh, MPAs, and again, that's, I'm just gonna drop that out there. <laughs> and uh, once you read the book, you'll, you'll, see, you'll see what's happening with the whole arc of the story and how people discover themselves. They discover themselves by getting, taking themselves out of their, their comfort zone and out of themselves, out of this up here, you know. So, if we are ready, I can start reading. Um, I could take just maybe a couple questions right now, just in case you needed just a little bit more insight into anything. Mm -hmm. So you were born in, in Hawaii? No, I was born in Milwaukee. You know, oh, okay, so, so you're born in the lucky, mm -hmm. and you've lived back to the Philippines a few times. Mm -hmm. And uh, my question is, how do you suppose connecting the Philippines helps you understand Filipino Americans here? Well, first of all, it made me feel I wasn't alone, that my way of thinking about uh, a culture that I hadn't been schooled in was not rare. In fact, it was pretty common to talk to other uh, Philippine American born um, children and, and, and uh, adults who, who were raised at the same rate I was and at the same age uh, range that I was, that uh, we were not quite privy, you know, to um, the culture back there in order for us to understand why we were the way we are, mm -hmm. you know? And that, that makes a very lonely existence. You know, you're thinking like, well, why I don't, I'm not part of this group, I'm not part of that group, you know? Mm -hmm. I identify with you and, and you're saying, you know, you're going through the same thing. 
so there's there's some there's a disconnect there, mm -hmm. you know, that happens, and uh, certain parents coming to this country and telling them outright, no, I'm not going to teach you the language. You know, you learn English, you learn American ways. You know, you sort of dismiss all that otherness. You know, if you're going to make it here, you've got to show you can be like them, and so you lose that. You know, or if you didn't have it to begin with, you just don't know about it. You know. And um, I think it takes a, a, a certain type of person to even want to make that quantum leap. You know, the ones who come here from the, from the Philippines, you know, they want to find out too, what, what's, what is this, this type of community <coughs> that exists here that was raised American and Filipino? And same thing over there, what is this over there? They're, they're Filipino and for some reason I'm not regarded that. Why, what, what, what did I do wrong, you know? Um, uh, so there's, there's, a, there's a guilt factor going in there. But that's the exchange I think that has to happen, you know, to make the effort. And uh, that's what this book is about. It was really, really meant to bridge that, that, that gap, you know? Um, that wasn't an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. It's, it's important in this organization because there is, and it started by people born here without any connection to, uh, to speak of the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And this attitude is developed that we are only concerned with the Filipinos here. We should not be concerned with anything in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't agree with that, but mm -hmm. just wondering how it affected you as an artist, the uh, connection with the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think you hit it on the head there. It's, it's, it's being an artist. It's, it's, it's wanting to expand your horizons farther than you know um, some other people would essentially because you're you're as an artist you are a reflection you know of, of the society you know whether you you're political about it or or, or you know um, uh, the imagery of it or something like that there there are certain steps you have to make as an artist if you're going to be a better artist you know. Um, Take on the fear factor, for one. You know. yeah, and there's, is, there's that fear of, uh, of, of just being um, not exactly ignored, but dismissed. I think that that hurts even more, mm -hmm. you know, to be dismissed. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. Sure, sure. I have a question. Yeah. I think it's not a question. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you for the privilege of reading your book. The first time I got out, I <laughs> think we put in the mail. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I said, I grew up in the Philippines. So when I read it, I actually had uh, two, um, two radars. One is what life was in the Philippines for me. And like I said earlier, every character that you put in here, every dialogue, I must have heard it in my life, lifetime, and I have, I've met someone who would have said it that way, mm -hmm. who acts this way, mm -hmm. whose behavior is this way, whose character is this way. As a literary work, were you conscious of balancing the understanding of mother and daughter? Like, when I finish the book, I have 50% of this and 50% of this daughter, mm -hmm. and I have 100% of a very tight storyline mm -hmm. in, in in this in this book. Mm -hmm. Were you conscious of that? Oh yeah, very <laughs> yeah. conscious enough to uh, essentially uh, strike it and start all over again. Ah, yeah, I started I over again, maybe about three or four times. Ago. No, oh. that's not it. That's not it. It's got to ah, be. Nice. It, 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 it's craft. Yes. You know. Yeah. And um. I think because I was a playwright, I got to know that mm -hmm. that sequence yes. Yes. Um, better uh, in, 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 <coughs> in applying it to a novel. Mm -hmm. Just trying to say, okay, what is the story? What are you really trying to say? Um, this, these are things that you ask yourself as a as an artist constantly. Mm -hmm. you know? And um, I still. <laughs> Tony, Tony, Tony. <laughs> the many times I go, could you read this? Could you read this part here? And running it by him many, many, many times. 
and um, a good eye, a good eye, good reader. So that really helps. Hire yourself one of those if you're going to write a book. <laughs> It was your card. Yeah. I think well, that, yeah, yeah, yeah but uh, and not just that, but just a lot of my, what I call the beta readers, mm -hmm. you know, who would feed back things to me that would say, okay, could you look at that bit and, and look at that? And, and it would be technical more than, um, what do you call it, uh, 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 constructive, let's say. So I, I had to add that, again, being a playwright, knowing how to, to weave all that you stuff did. in and make it mm -hmm. and make it work. Yeah. 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 You pulled every possible scenario and you did not flatly introduce your characters. They they grew from page one to the last page mm -hmm. and that and how you inserted wove in everything that we needed to know about them, about mm -hmm. the Philippines and the interrelationships of, of characters. So that that is a playwright skill. <laughs> yeah. Think of it. Yeah. 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 That's a crazy playwright. Yeah, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yes. But yeah. um, it got to be a, it's like when you're working a puzzle, you know, okay, I know that part, that part fits, mm -hmm. doesn't fit as well as it could, you know, and so you shape it and you make it, you, you make it fit better each time. I'm sorry, I'm going into a lot of this literary writer and stuff, but mm -hmm. it, this has been like what? Uh, 22 years of my life, really, trying to hone this story and, and make, it, make it what I really wanted to say. Mm -hmm. You know, from my point of view, from, you know, the mother's point of view, from the other's point of view. Yeah. And yeah. Um, it, it, it's something that I hadn't seen done before, you know. So I figured, let's just try it. Let's just try it and see if I can weave that all in together. And like I said, um, there were the times where I just wanted to throw it away. You know, it, it, I think when you get to that point, that's when you know you're onto something good because it means you don't want to approach it. Uh, okay, what am, I, what am I not approaching? What am I not addressing? And then just jump on it. You know, so the characters that you see are read uh, portrayed in there. Um, yeah, they take a journey. They take a journey, they do. and yeah. and you can track them enough to 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 relate to them mm -hmm. and to your own life. Yes. And all that. Yes. Um, I should read, huh? Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just yeah. yakking about it. <laughs> yeah, we'll kind of jump around here, but essentially I pick pieces from at least the first half of the book. I don't know if I'll read all of them. <clears throat> Thank you again for this water. I don't know where the Morgan Hill people are. <laughs> they said they were going to be here. <clears throat> so I did premise with uh, the characters who are in there, and um, I may allude to them again, just for a reminder. Okay, so her mother, Rena, has already uh, decided that uh, Lainey's going to come with her, and Lainey has not decided yet. It's like, oh, no, you're going to be there, I'll see you there. We're gonna so she decides to <coughs> take a, <coughs> a cable car ride through San Francisco. Lainey threw on her caftan and cropped Powell Hyde Street cable car a block from her cottage. She had a seat all the way, perhaps a sign. She had carried no man, priding herself on getting around, testing her travel skills, and imagining herself in Omak alone. For a simple Midwestern gal, she was exhilarated stepping onto the legendary, clanking, windy car on a daily basis, marveled still by the grip man working gear handles half his height. The rail still protested and squeaked uphill while passengers endured each other's proximity. <laughs> Singed air tastes like nickels in her mouth. The route skirted Chinatown, a cathedral, a mansion, hoity-toity hotels, a church, and the beefy hormonal male grill which reeked with aged meats and old cigars. At Market Street, laconic cops directed muddled traffic. Laney had educated herself around towns, known or new, around modes of transportation deciphering languages she barely spoke, with charts and their keys, like with men, 
but with tattered maps to their secret caves and leaving few crumbs marking paths to her own heart. Lainey had wished for a map to Rena's interior. God, a queendom for that map. She signaled a Hyatt Regency waiter once she got off the bus, the cable car. Funneling from point A to B through the city, she thought, had proved she was San Francisco's girl, not McGuanagos or Manila's or Omar's. Each successive floor with its puzzling walls slanted inward in the Hyatt Regency lobby created a tottering, dizzying effect for Lainey, like for Jimmy Stewart in Vertigo. She nursed a very expensive Glenn Lovett. Just the thought of travel with mom provoked her to drink scotch, little ice. Even mom's friend, Vi, had threatened to stay home three times in two months. You don't need a guardian? I don't. Vi had complained over lunch at Ming Szechuan Delight. <coughs> what are you up to? Rena sniffed. <clears throat> I tell you anything and it splattered everywhere like shit. I, you are shit. You go by yourself, see if I care. Vi paused. Wait, you still going? Why wouldn't I? I'm not helpless. I'll pay baggage clerks to carry boxes. Pay me, if I had to whine. Oh, just keep your secret and go to hell. Patient Chinese waiters brushed off white napkins nearby, rolling their eyes heavenward. Stubborn Reno won out. Their flight day arrived. Fly ate humble pie and tagged along. Once in the P.I., Philippine Islands both created havoc, particularly Reno with her grand dame entrance. Oi, I held up the plane. A balik by in box broke. Vi forgot her passport inside the bark box. Stewardess is found it. Four porters carried my boxes to the curb. I paid them four quarters. Over the phone, Lainey had asked. <coughs> <coughs> so no creature comforts or heating pad or ice cubes? We have ice cubes for five minutes. Just drink fast. Lainey related her warning from some PI students. A lot of NPAs kidnap tourists. The New People's Army? Rita snorted. <laughs> Lainey backed off. Well, that's probably not every island. Still, she quoted young one woman wearing her familial tribal neck scarf. Leites between Cebu and Samar, places that are really active. Lainey had nodded sagely. The woman had added, you should know this. To that, Lainey had just blushed. Dang, know it all, radical Ateneo now, SF State University student. Yet, Lady had invited rebukes earlier, quipping that hybrid Phil Ams were upgrades. Ooh, their reaction had whittled her to her knees in embarrassment with a cutting, I colonial mentality. <laughs> this phrase sliced through most of the lively discussions between Phil Phil's and Phil Ams, the Philippines born versus the American born. These students were at least the third generation whose local history had been peppered with the United States white savior antics after the PI had quashed their first oppressors for over 500 years, Spain. The same scarf woman had spouted, we revised our history, it reflects us more now. Your history books gloss over the histories of the counties the US conquered. She clipped this line, you should know this. Maybe Lainey didn't deserve the Hyatt's overpriced, warm, watered-down scotch. She drained it and headed out, still undecided and less informed. What was she flying into? Outside, she swerved south toward Market Street. An older, all silvery, white-haired woman caught Lainey's eye. She wore a kimono, bedangled hoop earrings, glittery bracelets, beaded necklaces, and was draped in a long, hippie-style, patterned, swirled skirt. She stood cawing and, and, and jangling her, her, her jewelry. Men in suits and women in designer outfits took great pains not to look, but had to peer over a hotel's littered refuse cart, blighting their views. The matron herself blocked a city bus. <clears throat> garbage, all garbage. You eat garbage, you live in garbage. The old woman blurred. This ain't it, this ain't it. Her clarion message declared that they, the suits, the purses, the shoes, 
and the snubs were not it. Everyone here here gaped as a silvery woman trudged off, mumbling and waving the air in front of her. Laney boarded the bus, stalled by the woman's rant. On the ride home, Laney thought, the woman, like a town crier, trumpeted about something larger, something that was it. Why is mom returning now? Why did Laney have students run the PA now? As if any sign was meant for her, or both of them, to heed, heed. Yeah. Um, oh, oh. Sorry. <laughs> No, 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 I've got allergies. No, 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 I've got allergies. Welcome, welcome. Thank you, thank you. No, 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 no. This is, we've just been chatting, chatting. Wonderful. <laughs> welcome, welcome. I'm glad you could make it. Okay. Um, now she's meeting the people in, in Ormark City, the, the uh, family she had never heard of before, cousins, second cousins, and, and by then she already has her, her uh, bodyguard with her, a second cousin that uh, she met in Manila, uh, realized that uh, somehow he had to get to Ormark City the way she did, so guess what happened? Mm -hmm. Read the book. Anyway, so now she's, <laughs> she's, in, uh, she's in Ormark City. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> um, Nita, the cousin, introduced Rena and Laney to the barely dressed, tasseled headed neighbors, none of whom laid. Oops, wait a second. Sorry. This is a very important one here. This is chapter nine. When the oldest woman, Manan, climbed through the window in Nita's kitchen, Lady knew that she was not dreaming. Within seconds, more faces surrounded her, wrinkled and smiling. Initially, Lainey had just noted two fingers testing the window ledge, and then a hand, which then disappeared. She figured she had imagined that. No one had hailed the May family. Bodies kept spilling in, using that one window. Another veiny hand groped for the ledge. Oi, a man called. Nate, that's up, Benita's husband, leaned out and offered his helping hand. Once inside, both Nate and the visitor pulled the woman to the ledge and easily lifted her into the room. Eight, Laney counted, had climbed into the house in thin cotton coverings or shirts. Exhausted, Laney bobbed her head. Apparently, no one considered using the front door. Graciously, half of the visitors came into the manan and even brushed off her flowered dress. The room buzzed as they pushed a chair toward her back. The woman, beaming, toothless, was enthralled to be involved, like a girl swinging her bare feet. Nita, and in a fawning way, Rena introduced Laney to the barely dressed, tassel headed neighbors, none of whom Laney would remember. At first, after her 15 hour red eye flight and four hour layover in Manila, preceding the redder eye flight into Tacloban and drive to Orma. The similarities in names, Laney realized, would confuse her. Nita, Bonita, Juan, June. Visitors spoke to and over each other as Laney nodded, eyes heavy. She smiled at their giddiness and her own awkwardness. She shook out her jet lag and then turned to her mother. Thirsty, Laney cleared her throat and held up an empty glass. She searched for the word water. But Juan, the bodyguard, scrambled to fetch the water pitcher and asked a quick Sabuana question. 
Nita nodded. Ay, ay, sige. He poured the water for Lainey. It boiled, otherwise he shrugged. Reportedly, there was no potable water on the islands, maybe rain-filled pools on rocks. Statistics included rocks as some of the 7,000 islands. Fresh water was scarce. Traveler's diarrhea could result. People boiled and refrigerated water before washing vegetables, June added. Sometimes. A man, wearing, a man wearing only shorts actually stated in English, she is a big in, you know, you know. <laughs> Lady clipped. Susu's right, thanks. Rena jabbed her. Don't be rude. Come on, Lainey thought. A stranger comments on her tits and she's being rude? Hmm. Susu's our tits. Even relocated U.S. Midwestern Gen 2 Filipino kids knew that. How old is she? Is she married? Where's her brother, the man, in the family? Lainey curled. She might as well be invisible, like a, a reference to a stool. How much does she weigh? She's big, see it, there, in the, the um. She sighed. By Armok standards, Lainey's breasts were triple the size of these women. Rena was in her element, the center of attention. She was royalty, the young, beaming, 17-year-old queen of agriculture, like the photograph she showed her children numerous times. She rattled along with the visitors in her version of Sabuano. Lainey noted silences and stares. Like Lainey herself, the visitors had no clue. What was she saying? But respectfully, they listened. I see you, see you, yes. Nita, a perfect hostess, patted Rena's hand and offered a slightly correct, corrected translation to the room, to which a number of the heads bobbed and grunted agreement. One man eyed Laney and lifted his chin, protruding his lower lip at her. Moka historia ka binisaya. I, June, someone said. Everyone she had just met in the last 10 minutes turned to Laney, expectant, till her mother sniffed. No, she doesn't speak the language, Bisaya nor Cebuano. None of them do. She broadcasts this like a scarlet letter for Lady to wear. A, I am American, instead of B, I'm bilingual. In recognizable English, Serena June probe, stall, why did you not teach them? A soft murmur went through the crowd. Lena himself turned to Rena. Mom, they get mixed up, their father was Ilocano. Reno, no kid of hers in sight, spoke not to Lainey, but to the house and shut off all conversation. Instead of a flurry of protestations filled the room, visitors leaned into Rena, imploring her to reconsider that she should have teached her own kids, that kids are like sponges and soak up whatever influences lay in front of them. That's how kids learn. That's what Lainey detected, they were all saying. Undeterred for now, June turned to Lainey, but urged the room to hear him speak. They all nodded, except their mono, still beaming toothlessly, palms on her knees. June cleared his throat. Lady's eyes widened. He sang. <clears throat> Welcome into the jungle, we got the fun and the games. Yeah. He was close, but not very. Everyone laughed openly and raucously. Unashamed, June raised his hand and held up his hand. The laughs faded away. He opened his mouth, stopped, and again, everyone blew out deep belly laps and clapped him on the back. He reverted to his more comfortable Cebuano. Rena said, we will have a family reunion in the school pavilion on the hill, God willing. For non church door, she said this term often. Lady calculated, people will get the word in, in five days. She looked around. No one knew what the heck she was talking about. Rejo, Mike, the driver, scribbled away, while another man pointed at the sheet, commenting in a low voice, this will go out twice Wednesday and Thursday and once Friday and Saturday. Her mother hissed softly. Oi, all of this is for you. So when she finally is given a tour of the island, they go to all sorts of little towns and 
uh, an area that is supposed to be a well, plantation. So you have the coconut, um, these are before the pineapple plantations have been set in yet. So they're going through the coconut fields and they meet up with a, a boy who has been hired to cut down the coconuts and, and uh, cut them up and pass them to them. Mike, the driver, drove over the ridge with the boy hanging onto the back of the Jeep. They stopped and still barefoot, the boy clenched the bolo knife in his teeth and climbed a shorter tree with a slanted trunk. He hooked the arched parts of his feet onto each side and pulled himself heavenward. Then he caterpillared his body, pushing with his arches. The girls held their hands to their mouths, eyes wide. So did Lady. She had never witnessed this feat before, as if he performed for her the first acrobatic trick she had ever seen. Unseen above the thick, leafy fronds, a boy called sharply, thwacked coconuts, tossed them down, and both Rena and Mike katonked the fruit of the palms, flicking at them with their forefingers and heard a resounding thunk. These nuts were hefty and full of milk. Mike called up for more. He had no bolo knife of his own. The boy whose tiny face peeked out above the branches tossed down more coconuts yet paused at the last one. Mike glared. There was a standoff. The boy held the orb like a football, then let it drop. He slid down slower than his ascent. Mike moved to cut the nuts, but the boy hacked at them and doled them out to the girls like cups. He would not let Mike touch his bolo knife. Mike scowled. Juan grinned and clapped the boy's back. Rena slipped on her shell and scooped out the innards with her fingers. Lady followed suit. Liquid dripped on her chin like a waterfall, cool and sensuous. The half-eaten coconuts were thrown to the roadside. Lady saw the girls giggling when the boy mumbled, Nita translated in a low voice to Lainey, Down with Lunas. She indicated Mike with a nod. Rena cautioned, Careful, too much will give you the runs. Boiled water kept any loose bowels in check. Alas, coconut milk would not. Both good to know, thought Lainey. The boy stood on the road with his knife as Mike pulled away from him. The jeep again packed with only one, and the six females, the two girls sighing deeply, a bit lovesick. How will he get home? Lainey asked. Mike shrugged. Hernando can get his son. Lainey shifted. Why was everyone so testy today? Mike grumbled. Think he can buck me like some young cockerel. <laughs> uh, that's a rooster. Talaga? Lainey meant to lighten the mood. I, I never saw a... You will. Mike cranked the wheel to the left. Now that's a fight to the end. About five kilometers from the house, Mike's front right tire blew. Lainey turned to everyone in the back seat. Nita's eyes twinkled. twinkled. Both of them burst out into laughter, reliving the built up tension. Somehow Mike's blown tire let out all the gas of his big plantation supervisor show. All the gas was let out of the whole day. Even Rena's melodramatic bank moment and the young field hand's recalcitrant, recalcitrant glare now seemed comic. Nina and Lady held their stomachs and split wheezy tears. Juan tried to shush them. Mike stomped about, kicking the spare tire and cursed, Who don't get a muscle gun, you bitch, son of a bitch? Lady howled, high pitched, swiping at her eyes. Both young girls and even Rena was puzzled. Mouse openly didn't understand Lainey and Nina's outburst. I agree with Louisa as so long as that's cuss word I ever heard. <laughs> Lainey guffawed even more. The girls giggled. Juan covered his mouth. So it's my mouth Rena mumbled. Sputtering to a stop, Nita and Lainey toned themselves down, down, exhausted. Mike refused to acknowledge any silliness. He carried the tire a few feet away to the ever-present makeshift vulcanization sheds, the term for tire repair. Rena tried to get Nita to tell her what was so funny. Nita waved her off. Mike rolled the tire back, and he and Juan installed it in grim silence. Back in the Jeep, Mike crumbled, depleted, and Nita and Lady burst it up again, hooting with loud abandon. Depleted, Mike glared above them, like the rubber. Everyone, even the clueless girls, howled till they coughed, hiccuping and laughing. They were uncontrollable all the way from Nietzsche's red gates. So.
So this is about a reunion. So then they, of course, have a lechon, and they're going to have a big, a big, big party, reunion party. And uh, in between going up to all these different places to uh, see sites and everything like that, um, they come back and they keep finding more and more people at the house. Like, there's more people. No, there's more people. And they finally get to meet the actual butcher, the butcher of the island who travels all up and down the, the, the coast. And he's been doing it for, for years. He's, he is considered the island butcher. The butcher was tall, very stringy, and dark. His massive, streaky gray hair bowed out, framing his narrow, glistening face. Stalwart, commanding, he looked like abolitionist John Brown, Lady decided. He was her image of an NPA. Like Brown's images, he posed, he posed with unblinking focus, patient, like the official Filipino eagle, five times the mass of any American predator. The cigarette never left the side of his mouth. He wore a threadbare short sleeve, faded shirt, long pants, and flip flops, the breath of him like dusted pecan, head to foot. He never blinked as he was introduced to everyone who had just arrived in Mike's Jeep. Mike, impatient to leave, drove off. Road dust masked his exit. Lady News, not staying in there for a frosty beer after a very public dressing down? Dom, uh, Dom, Lady too was awed by Dom, who kept that damn cigarette in his mouth, never dropping an ash. Do you want to see the piglets? Bonita's youngest, Sarasar, asked shyly. The pigs are penned up near the water buffalo and were considerably small, 40 kilograms or 90 pounds, pale, doe-eyed, with curly tails, high-pitched squeaks, and winning personalities. Lady compared the two legend gatherings so far presented dead pigs. How could anyone coos over something one day and barbecue pets like pigs the next? And then there were the dogs. Returning to the house, Lenny glanced at the clumsy, wiry, also whitish puppy. Two maids, both rather taciturn, squatted nearby, petting the animal, their looks inferring, it's just another dog. Lenny would not touch the shivering animal. On this trip, she vowed she would not bond with any house pet, living only to be a meal. Mm -hmm. This trip, she swore, no attachments. As, as the days go by, oh, by the way, there's a, there's a brownout going on. So there's, there's no electricity. They have to wait until uh, the electricity comes back on. And so every time again she comes back into the house, she realizes there's something else. There's, now there's no electricity. There's going to be a, there's going to be a, a, a storm, it turned out. It was, it was announced. And she goes back and she's, she's fascinated by Dom, the butcher. Dom never looked at her, intent on his, his prep work, his ever-present cigarette dangling from his mouth, daring the long ash at its tip to fall off. Lady guessed he was testing his own steadiness and the patience of viewers. She had heard him speak English, and well, too. May I? she asked. Laconically, he tapped his cigarette, allowing the ash to drop, before reaching for another pack in his front pocket. His eyes were jaundiced, the color of pale lines. He shook and tipped the pack toward her. She took one cigarette. He lit hers and his own on one match. She squatted like others she had seen in the ever-ready chair pose. Dom would not begin a discussion. She started. Where do you go from here? Zahn. Lady had learned some Filipinos pause before speaking for a very, very, very long time. Dom's was probably one of the longest. He pointed with his lip. <laughs> there. North, she figured, the direction to the land. Do you really remember my mom? She went by another name back then. Dom interjected and said without a pause, I know it. Lenny was impressed. His memory was legendary, still sharp and quick. She was white, her sister was dark. Her father, younger than her mother, Mapang, you know. He flipped at the end of his nose, looking far off at the mountains. She was stuck up. Lenny tried again. 
a snooty, um, full of herself? He looked down over his nose and pointed with his lip and then nodded. He clearly indicated that Rena thought herself above others. Well, that sounded right, figured Lainey. It still, should she defend her own mother to this new stranger who perhaps knew Rena better than Lainey did and for a longer time? Lainey drew on her cigarette, deciding Dom continued to sharpen one of his many knives spread on the ground on a heavy skin cloth. She got up. Don't go into jungles alone, Dom suddenly called to her back. You don't know the ways here. Lainey changed into her new shoes when she went into the house and did not go with her, that did not go with her long skirt. She winced. The Adidas were very tight. Mm -hmm. She put her regular shoes in a bag in case her feet began to hurt. Lainey noted to keep her mouth shut about cockfights, shoes, or anything ending up as presents by their door. Nate drove pell-mell in his Jeep to the market. Nina trekked off with Rena in town. Why did Horatio buy this? She asked Juan. How, how does he earn his money? Ma'am, Juan began, and she corrected him. Laney, Laney, you ask a lot of questions. She turned to him. I'm curious for my journal. Juan scratched his head. Sometimes it's just questions to ask questions. How far, how long, what time? It's just as long as driving takes, as far as our road goes. Talaga? <laughs> so, as the uh, time comes to kill the pigs, mm -hmm. she is noticing the atmosphere in the house and glanced at Rena, who was pretending to nap. Lainey timed the silence. She jumped when seconds later, her weight was cut by a scream. The ear piercing scream startled Lainey. Her paper research was broken. Her suggestion hung in the space between herself and Rena. She dashed off, following Sorry Sorry and Terry Terry. One of the piglets <clears throat> was being pulled with a rope to its doom. The pale white thing cried, agonizing, filled with terror. From afar, its companion, still corralled near the water buffalo, matched the pitiful howling. One of the girls stood with her fingers, plugging her ears. Lady found herself doing the same. She kept turning away and turning back. She had to see the full sequence. No, no, she, she wanted to block each moment. She and Sari Sari stood holding each other till Lady's nails dug into the girl's arm, and she yelped. Before them, men straddled the pig or collapsed, collapsed its feet to prevent it from kicking. One man stretched its neck. Dom drew the pointed, sharpened blade across the throat. Steadily, he then pushed the tip into an artery. The piglet eat once and lay still, not dead, just resigned. Blood streaming from its throat didn't even fill a gallon tub. The liquid would make the Nguan blood soup. Sorry, sorry, and Lady squirming finally entered the house, and she ran to the crowded kitchen, stopping to pump water into the bucket for her CR visit. Another world spun inside. Everyone took advantage of the now available electricity. More strange women filled the kitchen, practically tripping over each other, dashing between the huge counter and the stove. Terry Terry chattered to Lady, pale after her CR visit. It'll take all day to chop six dozen chickens for the reunion, Terry Terry giggled. Uh, giggled. Sixteen hours away. Manang Dong roasted the chunk rice and then times the chicken so everything's ready Sunday morning. Having the runs hardly made Laney expectant or excited. Outside, the air filled with the roar of men's voices. Mama! Mama! cried Sari Sari, very excited. Laney framed her view out the window. A half dozen rangy looking men with headbands, dark complected, draped with M16 rifles, strapped across their backs, stood clapping the shoulders of Dom's helpers. Most of them were deceptively small, with teenage builds. Dom nodded to their easy mamas. Bonita mumbled, they heard the radio notice. Early, Sige. She clucked her tongue. I, the Pabinya reunion takes all kinds. 
She pawed the air at the girls. No one seemed alarmed. The NPAs had arrived. Back to my earlier question. Sure. Why did you title it Turn Life at the Water Buffalo besides the comedic oh. uh, image of turning right and pointing the zone? Because uh, it was the first question everybody asks. <laughs> uh, uh, because it was a, a town at that time that didn't have any street signs. Yeah, yeah. You know, you knew how to get to your own house. Mm -hmm. And so every time Lenny tried to memorize how to get there, she get lost. You know, so they said just turn right at the water buffalo. There was only one water buffalo in one field at one turn off. You know, and um, so I mean, I remember going into one street and I don't, know, I don't see the field. I don't see the water buffalo. I said, okay, try the next one. And he went, oh, no, I couldn't find any. I said, you know, it must be that first one with it. And there was just this little dirt road. To, did I miss that? So it goes down there, and sure enough, there it is, you know. Yeah. And, um, and even in uh, arriving in Hawaii, the, the, I, when I called to say, you know what, I, I don't really have an address. And they said, that's okay, we need you, we need you, we need you. Okay, but did, I, I, don't I need an address to find my like, No, 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 don't worry, don't worry, you know? Mm -hmm. And it was, again, one of the first things to learn is that you just take things a lot easier, you know? Uh, okay. Signs are for, <coughs> for people who, frankly, are a little less exploratory. They need the signs, you know? It's like, you know what? Drive it, you'll find it, you know? Something will stir your memory. Something will remind you what it is. What, how about a water buffalo? Would you remember a water buffalo? I was like, yeah, yeah, I remember a water buffalo. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it just, uh, it just struck me as an intriguing title. Yeah, yeah. I had a discovery after reading the book, but uh, later, maybe, maybe the others want to ask the question. No, I'm willing to take any and all questions or comments or... Yeah, copies of the book to sell them in their mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was released on December 24th, so I was very uh, uh, clear with <clears throat> my publisher to say, I really would like this to be released in 2021. Uh, is there a chance? He goes, I don't know, I don't know, you know. I'll mm -hmm. have to see what, they're, what the, uh, the backlog is and everything like that, and boom! It arrived at my door December 24th, mm -hmm. so I was very happy about that. Um. Okay, so here's my interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I can't resist. No, 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 no. This is my like final moment after uh, getting to know mother and daughter. Uh, when you ask directions um, in, in our culture, there's always the very informed one. And then there's always someone who will have to interpret what you just said. So the relationship between mother and daughter, Reina and Lainey, is that full of interpretations. I mean, the daughter keeps interpreting what, what the mother is meaning to communicate to her. Uh -huh, uh -huh. She, uh, you know, she grew up here in, in America. If the mother says, turn right at the water buffalo, that's firm, that's instructive, that's full of power and knowledge, Reina receives the information and she will have to journey that instruction of where is the water buffalo on the day that her mother said, turn right at the water buffalo. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And where did that instruction take her? That's why my Observation is were you conscious that you were writing the equal uh, womanness of each of the ladies that you have and the main character? Yeah. Because there's this this you turn right on the water mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And that's that's my instruction. That's how I know it. Mm -hmm. And the daughter takes that line and goes on with life and it had many turns mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. her yeah. until the day that she experienced the Philippines. Yeah. More turns right. when she went to the Philippines. 
So that to me it is the meaning of the title. Not that you intended it that way, but I found a, a, a meaning in your title mm -hmm. in getting to know the mother yeah. and, and the daughter's relationship yeah. and that cultural bind between the two of them mm -hmm. and that shared experience of being in the Philippines mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and discovering what was not formerly discovered when they were in in the US. Right. It just bloomed into another layer of relationship for the two of them. Yeah. I think it only could do that under mm -hmm. those circumstances. Mm -hmm. You know, we were talking earlier about how how <coughs> excuse me. How uh, the passing of information from some parents to their children when they bring them to the States or when they have them in the States. And it's not it's not complete information. You know, we don't we don't quite understand why um, we are given these these instructions to do certain things. It's like there, there's no basis for why 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 is that why why are we doing this? Yeah. You know, and um, and to finally have uh, the one on one as this trip could only be between mother and daughter. It, they they had to be they had to be encapsulated. You know in the same time because it'd be like, okay, you never explained this to me before. Why why this no oh I thought I told you that. Oh no. <laughs> and oh it's because it's because, you know, and then looking to the, the rest of the room too, like, you you know what I mean. You know, what I mean. You know? <coughs> so you get the doubling of the interpretation. Mm -hmm. And then it makes sense. It's like, oh okay. I, I wish I would have known that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a lifetime of gathering, you know, uh, information and, and facts about a culture that's just always just over there. Yeah. It's just over there, you know. And realizing <coughs> once you're there, it's going to make it's going to make so much more sense, mm -hmm. you know, in the interpretation of it, in the in the in the demonstration of it. You know, um, you get it then, you get it. So again, that's the, the, the challenge of a journey anywhere toward a, a fuller education. Yeah. Is this book autobiography? Not for me. No. <laughs> Parts of it. Parts of it. I was just curious because, um, well, something personal for me is, um, you know, I was born in the Philippines. I was born in uh, Santa Mesa, in uh, New Manila. And uh, uh, Uncle Fred Cordova said, well, you're one and a half generation. And mm -hmm. this is because, you know, you were born there, but you came here at such a young age. I think mm -hmm. I was just a toddler. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in America, mm -hmm. in an army family, right? Mm -hmm. And so he says, so you're not really first generation, and you're not second generation because you're born here. So you're one and a half. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but when I was 19, um, uh, my um, mother sent me to the Philippines with my brother. Mm -hmm. And it's just exactly what he said, you know, why, you, you know, it sort of came out of the blue, you know. Well, why are you sending me back there now? Why, mm -hmm. you know, why, why, you know? And just no really answer. So my brother and I travel there and it's like um, really a foreign country to us because we lived all over the United States. and. Like your character uh, had not been encouraged to speak English. In fact, was discouraged to speak English. I uh, to speak Tagalog. That was their language, and discouraged to, to do that in any way. And so it's like, well, why do you want us to go here? You know? mm -hmm. So we, we went there. So that the chapters you read about, um, you know, they're in the country and they're talking about is it Lady, the daughter, mm -hmm. and how she looks and how her what susus are and. And, and I remember, I mean, I haven't thought about this in a long time, but I remember uh, being quite on display, you know, as a 19-year-old, and they would just, you know, talk about you as if you weren't there, and you were just an object. They'd talk about, oh, you're tall, or oh, you're light, or oh, you're skinny, or oh, you're this, you know, and it's like, I'm in the room. You know, <laughs> it's like, you know, very, very embarrassing, you know, or oh, you would be good to marry this person, or that person, you know, I said, well, I'm only 19, <laughs> you know, I'm just a tourist. <laughs> so, you know, it, it was really, so I thought, it, it really kind of spoke to me, that experience, because
because I, I really felt that from her, I can imagine you know, her attitude. It just seems like that's how it always is when you get around uh, other uh, Filipinos who are from the Philippines. You know, they, they talk about you as if you're not, as if you're invisible, but you're right there. Mm -hmm. And they talk about personal things, which is really embarrassing. <laughs> you know, really embarrassing. And it's like all you want to do is just not be in, you know, you want to actually, okay, go ahead and talk about it, but can I leave the room? <laughs> because, you know, this is not acceptable. So I just thought maybe you had experienced that because I, I felt it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, really, I felt it. I felt like a 19 year old again. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So But that also happened here, too, for that matter. You know, true. When you're an you know, adolescent girl, you're growing up. Yeah, and yeah. They're describing your growth. Yeah. And it's like, I'm, I'm standing right here. You're embarrassing me. Oh, yeah. But I, I'm excited, um, you know, I'm excited to read the book. I'm excited that, um, that he wrote it and that um, it's like this, this whole thing of. The two different worlds and then coming together, and I, I, you know, that trip probably was the um, most transformational uh, journey that I ever made. So I'm sort of excited to oh, experience good. it. What you want to share? So thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah, there are sections in it where I, I wondered, you know, okay, am I exposing a little bit too much? You know, that there's that element of. Do you know how inappropriate that is to talk about my body, <laughs> you know? And um, I, I think because, again, it, it is, it's, it's a cultural, um, in a way, uh, culturally acceptable for some reason. Like, yes, we are aware of your, of your growth, but also of your, your, uh, your, your marriage ability, marriage ability, you know, and you don't, we weren't thinking like that in, in, in McGuanagoe, Wisconsin, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, we were just thinking like, you know, what boyfriend can I get, you know, in high school or something, and, uh, and, and, and know that that's not what a boyfriend would talk about or even the boyfriend's parents, you know, that, what, why is this coming up? Mm -hmm. um, but I think it is it is that sort of marriage ability factor that they see mm -hmm. in and they're the next generation who's gonna carry on for us, who's gonna be the strong the strong line, you know, who's gonna be the sassy line, you know, who's gonna be the reticent, you know, uh, that's why you would look good with so and so, so and so, you know, you would boy him up or you're both the same type of uh, personality. And it it's Again, being there, it made more sense to realize that that was, that was, those were even issues, mm -hmm. you know? The other thing I thought was interesting in your reading was the, the part about how um, Lainey doesn't sp speak the language, and they do, and it's like, well, that, that happens today, all, all, it happens to me all the time, even now, mm -hmm. and, and so it's sort of like, Oh, you don't speak the language. Oh, you, you, you're not Filipino. Mm -hmm. You know, it's well, yes, I'm Filipino. Mm -hmm. Both my parents, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, but the, it was because you don't have the language, and it was it was really kind of made put in a way like a one up then, mm -hmm. you know. Whereas um, because you don't speak the language, you're not really like us, so you're not really. It, it was kind of put, a put down, mm -hmm. you know, like a shame, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it was. It was hard to, um, you know, usually the folks were older than me, so it's hard to have a conversation with people who are older than you. When you're telling, well, I grew up in, right in the 50s in America, do you know what that was like? Mm -hmm. You know, do you know what it's like to grow up in America in the 50s mm -hmm. when they didn't allow you to speak another language? Mm -hmm. When you got hit on the hands, if you even so much as said a word, mm -hmm. that was another, and then it was a rule, you get sent. And so, and so to the point where your parents were just like, you have to fit in, you can't speak with an accent, you can't, and, and you're talking to people now in the, you know, modern times, the 70s or the 80s, even now, and you're trying to explain that and they don't really understand that you grew up in this context and they grew up in this context. And I respect that you can speak it, but you have to understand why I don't. Yeah. And so that was always really a, and still I think it's a, a difficult one to explain mm -hmm. uh, to them. 
so, you know, it, it, I like that you brought that up. It, I think it would bring, um, for people who read the book, I think it would offer um, some space to have those kind of cultural conversations. That'd be nice, huh? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Open up a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. We want that. <laughs> That's so true because, you know, you know, experiencing that myself, you know, I remember growing up in Gilroy and being the only little brown kid in that class in first grade and there were these two Mexican kids that came into class one day and the teacher was, you know, the, the girl was crying and the, and the little boy, they just sat in the back of the room and when they spoke to each other, they got reprimanded by the teacher. I thought to myself, wow, you know, I kind of felt sorry for them because they were lost. Then the teacher goes, can you go back and talk to them? <laughs> well, I look more Asian at that age, you know, because my grandfather called me Insid. Okay, in our dialect, that means Chinaman. So that was his nickname for me, my, you know, my Filipino grandfather. So I said, I don't know that language. But they were not allowed to talk to each other. The girl was crying, you know, didn't get over that. Yeah. And so I remember when my grandfather picked me up to go home that day, I asked him, you know, how come? He goes, because in America, you only speak one language. Yeah. And you're not allowed to speak that other, so you have to be careful. Mm -hmm. So he says, you must, you know, read well, speak well, mm -hmm. because otherwise, you will be separated. Right. So, you know, that's why... Well, he was very well read and he was a machinist, but the best job after the war he could get was agriculture. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, but what I'm getting at is this, and now ESL, oh, you look at, yeah. you know, that what comes from school, it's multiple languages, you get two pages of it. Mm -hmm. you, they break down Asia into four different languages. Lao, Hmong, yeah. you know, so, it is great, I think it's excellent. Mm -hmm. You know, because it shows, you know, how far things have come and the sure. diversity in this country. And it adds to the, you know, to the greatness of what's here, or mm -hmm. the concept of the greatness. Mm -hmm. But when you think about it, I mean, just in this room, I think a majority of us remember, you know, being that, no, I'm not going to teach you the language, you know? Only at home. When our family, it was only at home. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother and mother, they were the Filipinos that taught us that you would have to at least understand. Mm -hmm. So I never told people I understand. Mm -hmm. Because, I, you know, I wanted to listen to them talk, you know, and catch them, you know, looking like fools because, oh, they had never thought I was fucking mm -hmm. especially when I was young. Mm -hmm. You know, you look massive, mm -hmm. you know, so, but, I, you know, you dummy up and you listen to them. But, you know, it's so true that now, with this, you know, in our culture, um, American culture, that you have those opportunities, translators in the school districts and in, in their life in itself. So, mm -hmm. you, you know, I think that's, you know, uh, but even then, you've talked to people that immigrate from different countries, you know, well, especially the Philippines, mm -hmm. you know, no, they, they want their children to speak that much. Yeah, so, that's good. Yeah, thank that you. That part's cool. I, I, I like it, but the whole deal with the lip, I know what that is. <laughs> I know what that is because I showed my buddies when I was in the Air Force in Guam. I said, do you want to watch something? I said, watch this. We were at a chicken fight. Because there, chicken fights were where? Okay. Yeah. So, you know, so I took them, you know, to a cultural thing. I said, let's And these guys were amazed. Wow, what's this, man? What, you know, I mean, like, you know, one guy's from Michigan and, and the other three are from Ohio. It's called Saturday, Sunday yeah. afternoon. Yeah. So, but I go watch this. I went, and everybody turned around. They go, what did you do? I said, I'm going to send a shirt. I'm going to get somebody's attention. Sorry. Oink, oink. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Oh. Any, any other comments? Any? Inside, I should know. <laughs> yeah. Robert. Could it be the, the, the Filipinos that speak to each other? don't understand what it was like for the first wage mm -hmm. in the 1920s mm -hmm. into a strange land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They have to remember that when they came here, they're only about five years from the Baranda yeah. and their culture. Yeah. And so what's important to them is to assimilate here in the United States. Mm -hmm. And you want your children to assimilate. So you want them to be English. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's 
true for my generation. Yeah. All of us in my generation can speak Ilkhan, Bikola, and Tagalog beside mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. However, if you heard Ilkhan often enough within context in your family, mm -hmm. you could understand what they're saying. So after a while, my mom and dad understood that we knew what they were talking yeah. about. <laughs> Even though, that's how I speak later. Right? And then ultimately, you learn some of the phrases, just yeah. like the kids who, who have uh, Tagalog parents. Yeah. Or Yeah. Mm -hmm. The key yeah. phrases, the ones you mm -hmm. apply to you. Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> what so that, I experienced the same thing. In fact, it was, it was on my dad. When we were going to an airport uh, in San Jose, there was a, a woman who saw us and obviously was Filipino. So she spoke to my dad in Tagalog. Mm -hmm. Well, he's a Lagano. Mm -hmm. He's hard of hearing. Because he worked in a defense plant before there was an ocean. Oh, boy. Yeah. So, so the, the lady was saying something to my dad in Tagalog, and he ignored her because mm -hmm. he didn't understand it. She kept yelling at us, you're not to look him. Oh, not to look him. dear. That, my dad didn't care because he was here and here. Well, she was out there me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to I'm at the end. Full blood of Yeah, 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 yeah. Even though I can't speak the language. Yeah, yeah. Because the language is all Yeah, it does hurt. It does hurt, you know? It's interesting because, I mean, I mean, I'm sure everybody knows that feeling where it's just sort of like, why? Why do you? Why would you not welcome me? You know, maybe I don't know that tongue. Maybe I don't know the language fully. But I, I'm you. You know, we're all, we're all one. And you just, it's another reason to feel left out. I think. You know, it's hard enough going to uh, American school and realizing you're the only Filipino kid in the whole school, and um, and then to be with your your own people and say they're saying no, you're not Filipino because you don't know the language. You know, you don't. You, you, well, where do I belong? Where do I belong then? If, if this is the the categories you're putting me in, that's, you know. Yeah. So. But you see, the good thing about growing up here in Stockton and, and not realizing this was the epic center of Filipino life on the West Coast, you know, we didn't know any better. So there were kids that you know I grew up with, with you know, their families are in the photos and in you know and. Uh, so, you know, some of those names, I didn't know they were mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. pioneer families. They were just my friends, yeah. you know, and friends we grew up in. But you could hear us talking sure. like you did, the, the, what are yeah, you yeah. doing, you know, yeah, you know, yeah. making fun of each other at school and doing it. And the other kids would just look at you and, you know, yeah. yeah. But it was a way that we could act that out exactly. amongst each other. Because yeah. we were the either the first or second generation born here and grew, growing up here in Stockton. And you know, and can make fun of that, and you know, whatever mestizo culture you were from, right. you know, and, and it was across the spectrum. But you know, it was a way that we can have fun and to express that. Because when you go home, you do that. You know, you don't make fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can't make fun. Yeah. I have to respect. tell the story. You reminded me of this story when I first came to California. Again, I'm looking for my tribe. I'm looking for some some place to belong. I come from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and. I, I put it, uh, yeah, I decided I'm going to live in California because I think there's more people there that I can identify yeah. with, you know. And uh, they say, oh, my parents say, okay, well, go see your uncle, the <laughs> Salinas, and then there's Stockton. And I'm going, okay, I'm going to go to all these places. They pick me up at the, <coughs> at the bus station in Salinas. I get off the bus, and I, I see my uncle, and of course, he's just standing there, very calm, like, like, you know, I was, you know, the new one in town, and he, he, he drives me down the street, and he stops when he sees a, a man crossing the street, and he just stops in the middle of the street, and he goes, yep. <laughs> back and forth. And I'm watching them, I'm like, do you know him? <laughs> no, he's Filipino. <laughs> he didn't need to know his name, he just knew he was Filipino. I went, wow, wow, they recognize each other that way, you know? And um, it was like I, I said again earlier about my, my Aunt Letty and Uncle Frank who here in Stockton welcomed me so lovingly into the family. They, uncle Frank actually helped my father and my uncle uh, come to the States. He, he helped sponsor them. Mm -hmm. So, as he did many people. 
And when he uh, uh, invited me, when they invited me to my first Christmas in, in California, they said, come, come celebrate at our house. I went, oh, oh okay. Oh, you know, house full of Filipino, you know. You know <laughs> that <laughs> yeah. And they're, they're passing out gifts, and I went, oh, God, this is so nice. And look at how many people there are here, you know. And she hands me a gift. I swear, I almost burst into tears. Oh. I'm like, you're giving me a gift and I just got here, you know? And it was a pair of gloves, which I still have today. Oh. I still have those gloves today. But it was just, just an indication that I made the right move. I needed to break out of my own shell, thinking I was alone, and um, see, see where, where it was that I, I could feel home. Um, maybe um, it's Saturday. You know, where the lot, we tell stories about the lodges, the fraternal lodges here, and the monos who didn't have family would be out to give gifts to every child mm -hmm. wow. during Christmas time. Wow. And so much so that even mm -hmm. Alex Favro talks about getting big money cash when he graduated. Wow. Um, wow. Because the monos cared for him, wanted to invest in his, uh, in his education. Yeah. That is beyond philanthropy. That is really the family that was never there for them, and yet the heart knows how to be supportive of the next Filipino yeah. that they know yeah. about. So, yeah, so a lot of the memories is of the Gobi Lodge, you know, Elsa talks yeah. about yeah. it. Yeah. Every person yeah. we get yeah. here is in Masalam. Yeah, yeah. in Masalam too. Yeah. I think one of the most retold stories of the, the, the rich generation mm -hmm. that I've heard about getting gifts from people they did not know, the monos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They didn't know, but they were getting gifts. Yeah. Well, this is, this is good. Come sit down. What? No, it's not a yeah. So I, I guess I can start signing uh, books that people would like to buy. And I would like to talk to each and every one of you anyway, even if it's just say hi. Yeah. But oh yes, yes, <laughs> Marilyn is. Yeah. I just want to thank you, G, for writing this wonderful book. I'm going to tell you why, and I apologize to all of you for us coming uh, so late, and I miss the opening. Um, my family is a Bada family from San Esteban in Ucosur. And I remember coming, I don't know, it was, uh, my dad was in the first Filipino infantry, and I love yeah, the uh, 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 display that you have here. And I'm so delighted that she said, come, come and stop me. Yes, yes. From Gilroy. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. small world. Uh, and, and San Jose. Uh, we, my dad was, as I said, married my mother, she was a war bride, and I was born here in 1947. And, um, I don't know what wave I am. <laughs> <laughs> but we didn't start naming waves when, when I was born. When I grew up here, I experienced everything that you mentioned in here in terms of, you want your child to be successful, do not speak English to them. No, I mean, do not speak. Get a yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Get a punter. Don't speak your language to them. Uh -huh. And I hear that that's a microaggression. There's names for everything. Yes. Right? Yes. So that made me feel what? Ashamed of my parents' language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it made me come, you know. Mm -hmm. I, it just made me who I am, though. Mm -hmm. But I'm delighted that I met this woman who was born in all places in Milwaukee. Thank you for inviting me.
this book and for being the woman you are, that I think that in this little conclave of Filipinos and the history, so much love and so much kindness is part of what I think all of us who are parents and grandparents, my aunt and uncle, my aunt came here when she was 19, mm -hmm. in the 1930s or whatever, and she was a, one of the first married Filipinos, I'm assuming, I, you know, because my history, our history is not a big spot mm -hmm. in this United States. Mm -hmm. However, everything you say here, means, it, it says to me, there's a community that is. Got to, got to start saying, you know, we're proud to who we are, mm -hmm. and we want all of our children to be now. Mm -hmm. We're all intermingled in, we're a whole different group. Yeah. And it's wonderful, it's beautiful, it's the world. Yeah. And the whole world is screwed up as we know. But the Filipinos can never be that way. Mm -hmm. They will always value the family. And to me, that's the most important thing. Yeah. Yeah. Family.